from our church family here with us, as well as you meeting with us from home. And so I'm so thankful uh, for this opportunity once again to be together. Uh, it is nice when you hear the singing. The last uh, couple months, the singing has been pretty much the worship team and a few of us scattered throughout the building. And uh, this was a little fuller, a little nicer to hear more voices participating with us. And I hope you're doing so at home as well. And so uh, the first service was nice to catch up a lot of our, our folks. And afterwards, uh, we dismissed outside here. We have coned off certain areas so people can fellowship without warrior cars coming through. And so we'll encourage you all to do the same after the service here today. And uh, so thankful to see your faces. And I want to get to say hi to each and every one of you after the service if we can. And uh, we'll, we'll keep the social distancing, but at the same time, uh, enjoy our time of fellowship after the service over. As the previous um, uh or the portion of scripture was read previously, Acts chapter number 12, you can turn there, and uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 5, and then also Matthew chapter 16. If you can remember back in our series of the book of Acts, uh, we were dealing with this acrostic uh, that I came up with to kind of explain how we'll be going through the book of Acts. We entitled it Acts Empowered, uh, dealing with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. There's a new event that took place back in Acts chapter 1 and 2, and the empowering of people with the Spirit of God for the work of God. And that empowerment is still going on today. If you are a believer, God has empowered you to do His work. You don't have to be a pastor or missionary evangelist. He has empowered each individual believer to be uh, of use to Him. But the letter C is what we're focused on. The letter A was ascension. The letter C is church. The letter T was trinity and transition. And the letter S dealt with salvation. So as we go through these different studies, we're focusing in on one or two of those uh, major points. But uh, let me just give you some introductory notes before we jump into this passage of Scripture. I want to speak to you today about the unstoppable church. The unstoppable church. And uh, it's a wonderful subject that we see in the Scriptures, and particularly as we see what's taking place in the book of Acts and in our own time right now as God's church while we're separated from one another. Truly, we have faced an unprecedented absence from the normal gatherings of our local assemblies. The pandemic has caused a great disruption in our way of living, uh, but our church has, is strong and our God is even stronger. I am so blessed to be the pastor of this congregation for many reasons, but the, for those of you that work on the front lines uh, in the nursing industry, uh, I thank you. I thank you for your continued help and your continued work along those lines and serving in that capacity. I know that some people truly do put themselves at risk uh, in these uh, different places that they serve, but we thank you. For those who have reached out to help others during the absence from church services, thank you. For those who have continued to serve by caring for others, by witnessing, by attending many, many Zoom meetings, all of us are getting used to new technology and new types of way of uh, communicating with one another, and uh, we appreciate uh, all that have been patient in the learning process. Uh, but then for many others that have met the needs of, of the church and, and others that they've reached out to, typically when we were back in session, everything was normal. A lot of the uh, requests came in through the church offices to different staff members or people in the church, and, hey, pastor, so-and-so needs this, and we would say, all right, let's, let's try to figure out how we're going to you know, get people to help out. What we have been finding out the last couple of months is by the time we hear about it, it's already been handled by some of you. This is awesome. This is the church at its best. They are working without having to have someone tell them how to go about doing these things. And so what a blessing it's been. I've, I've had so many people, after I found out they had a need or something was going on, I say, hey, I just heard about this. Pastor, we're good. Somebody else came over. They helped us with this project or somebody dropped off food or somebody went over and met with that person. We had a prayer meeting together and just helped each other through a very difficult Like, Awesome. This is what the church should be. This is the way it should be happening. And so... If nothing else, we're learning from this pandemic how to truly be the church outside of these walls. And that's what I want to speak to you about today, the unstoppable church. The word church in the Greek language, which is our, predominantly our New Testament, is the word ekklesia. Ekklesia is just a general term meaning an assembly or called out ones. When you put the uh, Christian church um, moniker on it, or if you explain it in a way that you would understand that Jesus said it was his church. He called it my church in particular in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. We read that earlier. Uh, he called it my church. And so we understand that there is a difference between 
Jesus My Church, which we are one of his churches, and also a group of people that meets for a town council meeting. That is, the word would be church, ecclesia, but it means an assembly. So the town assembly, it could be a group of people that go out for a protest, which we've seen many in the last few days. Uh, that's an assembly of sorts, a mob of people assembling. But the Greek word is ecclesia, or church as we know it. And so you have to be specific when you talk about what kind of assembly. But when we talk about Christian churches, most people now, the, the meaning is assumed. We, we're talking about a group of people that gather together, that have the same doctrine, that have trusted Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, they've been baptized, and they come together for fellowship and carrying out the mission of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of church that we're making reference to here in the book of Acts and as Christians. But in Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus says, I will build my church. And I love that. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it puts in perspective what we are here to do, what we are all about. And so this is not John's church, although I may say, well, my church is Community Baptist Church. That means I'm associated with it, but the my church here is Jesus Church. So that gives us an understanding of who's in charge of it, who came up with the idea, who instituted it, and what the purpose should be. It should be in keeping with Jesus' purpose and his mission. So we talk about an unstoppable church. We're talking about Jesus Church. And then um, years ago, somebody asked me, so, Pastor, if you ever thought about if you start a church again, would you rename the church? Would you call it something different? And I was thinking about this passage. I said, yes. I said, I would call it my church. Now, that could add some confusion because if people say, well, you know, do you attend church anywhere? I say, yeah, well, sure we do. What church? My church. And uh, I say, well, yeah, well, of course it's your church, but I mean, what's the name of the church? My church. And uh, people would kind of be a little church. Well, all right, fine. Where's your church located? My church is located at 950 Gold Star Highway, Groton, Connecticut. You can see how that could be a little confusing to people just by calling it my church, but I think that would be a fun way to advertise your church. But we realize that that's in reference to Jesus' institution of the local churches. And of course, we understand that the, the empowerment by the Spirit of God to the churches. And so this is uh, uh, an interesting uh, statement he makes. In the New Testament, approximately 115 times the word church is used. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it could be used for a mob, which we noticed in the book of Acts, I believe it was, there was a mob of people called came out. That was an assembly, if you would, but the term is church. Uh, the church in the wilderness is mentioned, and that is talking about the nation of Israel. When they assembled in the wilderness, it wasn't a church like we have today, but it was a group of people that were assembling that was God's people, the, the nation of Israel that was assembling there. Local church is used the majority of the time in the New Testament. So we talk about church at Ephesus, the church at Antioch, the churches of Rome, on and on and on. That's talking about the local assemblies, our type of churches. And then also the invisible or the universal church, as many people know, that's talking about all those who are truly born-again believers are, you, are linked together throughout the world in this kind of idea of a universal or invisible church, spiritual church. So that's also used in the scriptures. And so those are the terms, the way that the word church is used in our New Testament. But what can we learn from the church in Acts that speaks to our current situation of uncertainty and crisis in our own country and really around the world? So let me go back and just repeat what we've already learned in the book of Acts and uh, from other studies as well. First of all, we know the church was founded by Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, the my church statement there, he's mentioned that he would build his church. That was present to the future. He was going to continue to build his church. We learned it is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Acts chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, he said to the disciples, go and tarry in Jerusalem, wait for the Spirit, wait for the promise of the Father, which we know is going to be the Spirit empowerment coming upon them. Also in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, we learned that they were empowered for a purpose. It was a mission. It was to be witnesses, meaning even unto death. They were, to, they were commissioned to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to do so, as well as we are today. We also learned that it followed the apostles' doctrine, Acts chapter 2, 41 and 42. And they that gladly received his word, meaning they trusted Jesus Christ, the word speaking of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection, they received that for their salvation. They were gladly, those who did that were baptized and the same day added unto the church, about 3,000 3, souls. And so there it then goes on to say, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' 
doctrine. So there were certain essential doctrines that the apostles sought that they received from Jesus that they were to continue to teach, which we still teach today. And so that was uh, uh, what we learned also about this church. We learned that to be a member of this church, you must believe that Jesus is God and that his death, burial, resurrection is necessary for you to believe and ask Jesus Christ to be your personal savior for you to be accepted into this church. And that's a statement of your own personal testimony. But then also to be a part of a local church, you must be baptized by immersion to be a part of a local, local assembly. And the general assembly, once you get saved, you're part of God's spiritual family. But to be a part of a local assembly, salvation and baptism are requirements according to the scriptures. Acts chapter number 6, we learned that they organized members of the church in order to meet the needs of the community. And Stephen was one of those ones that was uh, ordained or, or uh, selected to be one of the, the leaders at that time with other seven men, uh, full Holy Ghost, honest, honorable men that were able to serve in that capacity. Then we also learned that it was persecuted. So the church was persecuted from its very inception. The Jews took issue with the preaching about Jesus for salvation alone. And we understand the Sadducees preach, uh, uh, brought persecution in Acts chapter 4 because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They didn't believe in the resurrection, and so they persecuted the, the church, the early church at that time. The Pharisees persecuted the early church because they went against tradition, and they went against the law, according to them. Then we also had Rome, which was the power at that particular time. They were the ones who wanting to keep peace with the larger community of Jewish people who were non-Christians, when they complained to Rome, Rome being worried about the Jews uh, getting mad, they would then take it out on the Christians. They would try to suppress the Christians and they would persecute the Christians on behalf of the Jews. They would give them authority like they did for Jesus. Reluctantly, but Pilate gave authority to kill Jesus. Reluctantly, uh, they also allowed the, the killing of Stephen. Now we come to Acts chapter number 12. In Acts chapter 12, we find Herod. That's the title, if you would, to a king. He was a puppet king. Let me just give you a little background on this Herod. Uh, it's Herod Agrippa I who is the person. This is the grandson of the Herod who killed all the babies during Jesus' time. So this is now the grandson. The father, all right, so this, this is kind of crazy. The grandfather killed the babies in Jesus' time because the wise men didn't come back and tell the Herod at the time where Jesus was. The, the grandfather's son, I'm getting all muddled in my mind now, his own father put him to death. The grandfather put his son to death. And then the son at that time was about three years old. So this is now the king. He's now set up by Rome, who is in favor of Rome. He actually spent time with the, with the, the leaders of Rome he went to prison for a little while. He was an ungodly man, but they set him up as the puppet king of Israel. And the, the religious Jews didn't like him at all, but yet there was that unsettled relationship. You do good for me, I'll do good for you. Let's, let's persecute the Christians and we'll all be happy. Uh, that's a very broad explanation, but that's kind of what was going on here. So now this Herod, the grandson of the one that I mentioned earlier, is the one in charge. And in verse number one, again, we pick it up. Now about the time of Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. So listen, folks, this is the church we're talking about. This is the local assembly that was there in that region. This Herod was willing to vex it, meaning to persecute it, to hurt it, to bring harm against it, to damage it. This is what he set out to do. And notice what happens here. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He gave permission for one of the disciples who was with Jesus Christ, whose brother, John, was also a fisherman with the others. He had him put to death. But notice what it says next in verse number three. And because he saw it, what's the next word? Pleased. Because he saw that it pleased the Jews this larger body of people that he wanted to make happy so they wouldn't bring disruptions against his kingdom. So he saw it, please, it. he went out for Peter's, to get Peter's head now. He had Peter arrested. He put Peter in prison. But because of the holy days, he had to stop. Because of the Passover feast coming up, they had to stop because the religious Jews, now get this, the religious Jews are so religious they have to keep their holy days 
but they're willing to murder innocent people. Does anybody else get the irony, irony there? All right, so you got the religious Jews so intent on keeping the holy days, but it's okay for them to kill a Christian. Doesn't make any sense, but that's what's going on here. So Herod has to put him in prison and wait for after the holy days. During that time, what we find out is Peter escapes from prison. It's a great story. You can read the rest of that on your own. That's not the focus of our message today. Let me go back and give you an illustration now. During the 1918 influenza pandemic in Birmingham, Alabama, churches were closed. The Birmingham News offered a, to print sermons and service outlines, scriptures and announcements sent in by various clergy to help people worship at home. On Monday, October 7, 1918, the Alabama governor, Charles Henderson, ordered the closing of schools and churches and theaters to avoid the spread of the Spanish influenza. It was a similar situation to today where the spread of the coronavirus has forced the closure of most houses of worship since March 15th. Some have already announced that they will close their churches until May or June, such as the case of us. We willingly said we'll close down for the safety of our people. Newspapers ran excerpts of local church clergy sermons, and I thought it would just be interesting that you would understand that this was 1918, before internet, before mass TV and all the, all the different channels. We understand that this was uh, something that the newspaper was the place to go to get information. And so some of the message titles, number one was a unique Sabbath, how to worship at home with your family. So they called it a unique Sabbath experience. That was one of the messages sent in, print, printed in the paper. Prepare to meet thy God was another message, kind of like what we hear today. If you're on, online at all, man, you see a range of what people are saying about what's going on. Uh, another message, uh, where are the big men? And uh, the idea behind that message was about uh, men and women who would do right in, in light of adversity and take a stand for God, but not allow the, the trials that they're going through and the trials they're facing to thwart their faith. Uh, another one, how to tithe. Well, you know it was on the mind of that church during that time. Uh, how to tithe. And then uh, the, another one was dark valleys seem necessary. And the message there was how that God sometimes allows us to go through dark valleys. Listen, Christians, we're not immune to sickness. We're not immune to persecution. We're not immune to financial reversal. We're not immune to anything that the common world is, is going through. That's something God still allows to come in our life for time and for purposes that only he knows sometimes. But what we must recognize is that dark valleys are necessary. Sometimes they get our attention. Sometimes they're there to bring out the best. And as I mentioned earlier, you people have done awesome. The church has been strong while we've been scattered. You have been filling the needs of people and just being the Christian that God's called you to be. Truly, God's church is unstoppable when they truly do practice God's principles. And so we, what I've been blessed is just to hear through the grapevine of things that are going on. In 1918 and 19, the influenza pandemic started as World War I was ending. Can you imagine? They just come out of a devastating war. And now the pandemic starts. And we, we understand that this was what going on. 20 to 50 million people died because of the pandemic. 20 to 50 million people. And they said the numbers aren't even accurate because they don't have the same type of ways of measuring as they do today. Because Spain was believed to have experienced the first major reported outbreak, it was nicknamed the Spanish flu. But I want you to know something else. At the same time all this dark valley was going on and all this devastation was going around around the world, thousands upon thousands of people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. See, what sometimes happens is during dark times, God can bring the light of the gospel smack into the eyes of those who are searching or questioning or wondering what in the world's going on. And that has been a question that some of you have already answered for your friends, for your coworkers, for others that you know. That's the answer right now that we're able to see and promote online to masses of people who are watching from around the world, not just our church, but many churches. And so this illustration I give you here is because where we are in the book of Acts, it was another dark time for them. Where we are in our society, in one respect, it's a dark time. We don't know how long this is going to go on. We don't know what the end result is. But what we do know is that God is still in charge. And when God is in charge, his church is unstoppable. Let me just read you to put in perspective what Jesus' words were prior to ascending up into heaven. Remember his great priestly prayer? John chapter 17, if you want to turn there with me, I just want to point out a few things. 
In John chapter number 17, beginning in verse 1, here we have Jesus making mention of his glorification. Verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son, that the Son also may do what? Glorify thee. Verse 5, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee when? Before the world was. So here Jesus identifying, hey, I was also with the Father before this world ever existed. So he and the Father, as we know, are one, they're unified. He's saying, I desire that same glory that I once had before I came to do this earthly ministry. Set me back up on the throne in my royal place, which we know that's what Jesus deserves. And so we see that his desire was to be glorified once again. But in that, he now goes through and he prays for us. He prays that God would continue to work in our lives and to help us do the mission he's called us to do. Notice what it says in verse 11. He says in verse number 11, And now I am more in, uh, now, excuse me, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those who has, thou hast given me, and they may be one as we are one. Notice what he says there, keep them. That means guard them. He was asking the Father for us to guard us. Verse number 17, he prays for our sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. What is truth? The word of God is truth. Then also notice in 21 through 23, he prays that we'll be unified as a church, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them and hast loved me. So here we have Jesus praying that we as God's people will be unified. And you know what the result of that is? If the church is unified, you know what it says here? That the world may know. Unification does something pretty awesome. When people out there in the world see a church unified for the cause of Christ, it makes them pay attention, makes them realize Something's going on there. You don't usually see a whole lot of people unified. Now you see people unified for what we're seeing, protests, see unified for a cause. But you know what happens after a while? Those filter apart, they splinter apart. God's church for over 2,000 years now has been unstoppable. It may not look the same. It may not be in the same places. It may be that they're, they're, they're in, in multiple places. Some have started and stopped and others have taken off. God's church is unstoppable. It's not just this particular locale. It's that God's people understand what the purpose is and know how to carry it out. One last thing I want you to notice here in John, this great priestly prayer. Look at verse number 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, this is Jesus speaking, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these. He's talking in that time. For that time when he was giving us it, not to my, just my apostles and disciples, neither I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So he was looking down through the annals of history to 2020. He knew that all those who would come after that particular time needed to know the same thing. Jesus said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying you'll be strengthened. I'm praying that you'll glorify me. I'm praying you'll glorify the Father. I'm praying that you'll be unified. And I'm praying you'll be sanctified to set apart from the world to use your life to live for, for God. That was his prayer. So why is the church unstoppable? Why is the church unstoppable? Let me give you four quick points. Number one, the church head is Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter number one. In verse number 22 and 23, the church's head is Jesus Christ. This is so important. It mentions it. We mentioned Matthew chapter 16. We see that it mentioned there that he says, I will build my church. This is Jesus speaking. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, it speaks of God giving Jesus authority. And it says, and he hath put all things under his feet. Talking about Jesus. God has put all things under under Jesus' feet, meaning Jesus is the supreme authority. And he gave to him to be head over all things to the what? 
To the church. Who's the head of the church? A lot of people mistake. Say, well, the pastor is. No, 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 no. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. I am, I am just a shepherd. I am just a plowboy. I'm just someone to come alongside and say, hey, folks, God's calling me to be a pastor, but I'm to lead you to follow him. That's, that's the job of a pastor. Lead you to follow him. Equip you to do his work. And so we understand that Jesus Christ is the head. Now think about this. If Jesus is the head, there ain't nobody more powerful than him. There is nobody that can stop him. There ain't nobody that can do anything against him. You may say, yeah, but you just read the text where James was beheaded. Yes, but what do we see? That only advanced the cause. You say, well, I don't want to have James' testimony. Well, neither do I. I don't want anyone to cut my head off. But we also know that there are times where we go through dark valleys, but if, if those who go through dark valleys remember the mission and they stay focused, it's amazing how God can bring about greater fruit for his cause. He knew. Jesus went through persecution. Paul, Peter, all, many of the apostles, uh, all the apostles, but then many other Christians, even up to today, still go through persecution and troubles and trials. And what happens? The word of God goes forth because they're still keeping true with the mission. The church head is Jesus Christ. That's why the church can be unstoppable because our power is not from us. Our power is from God. Our power is from the Holy Spirit of God who works in us and through us. Number two, the church is not confined by a building. These four walls that we, we come in and we call this the church, it's actually the church house, the church facility. The church is all us, saved believers. We are the ones who make up the church, this, this assembly. And so what we understand is that the church is not confined to these walls. It's interesting that the beauty of the church is that it's mobile. Not just your mobile phone, which is great. You can watch it. You can read it. You can study. You can text. You can talk to people about church on your phone. People right now are watching us online at home. But listen, the beauty of the church is that we're mobile. We can be out there in the public. And more so than ever, you have been out there. You've been talking to friends. You've been talking to coworkers. You've been ministering to one another as Christians. You've been doing the work that God has called us to do, and nobody's had to be there to say, okay, hey, we have uh, this many people. Can you go visit these people? Hey, can, this person has a need. Can you go do this? No. What's happening? The Spirit of God is speaking to you, and you're just doing it. That's the beauty of the church being mobile. It doesn't have walls. We're able to be out there doing God's work. And this has been a wonderful encouragement to me as a pastor to know that our church is out there doing the work even though we're not here together sending people out. I want you to notice in Ephesians chapter 4 the characteristics that are able to be practiced outside the walls of the church that represent Jesus Christ. And I'll go through this quickly, but I want you to notice this. We're talking about the church not being confined. Why is the church unstoppable? Number one, the church head is Jesus Christ. Number two, because the church is not confined by a building or walls. Ephesians chapter 4 goes along with this, and it says in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. That term Gentiles there is talking about those who are not living a life of godliness. Those who would be unsaved, they're, they're involved with ungodly things. So it goes on to say here, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. So he's talking about unsaved people. That's what he's talking about. Because of the blindness of their heart. Do you realize that every unsaved person is blind spiritually? You must understand this. The Bible tells very clearly that Satan blinds the minds of those who don't believe. Do you understand that? Satan blinds the minds of those who don't believe. If you want to pray for someone who's not saved, ask God to bind Satan. Ask God to allow their heart to be broken through spiritually. This is not a, a, a mental thing. This is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual battle. The reason why some people don't get saved is because Satan has got a plan for them, whether they like it or not. And Satan is blind in the mind. They do not want them to get saved, maybe because they know like the Apostle Paul, if that guy gets saved, look out, world. What will happen if this guy gets saved? What will happen if this girl gets saved? Look out, world. But Satan is blinding the mind, and the Bible talks about it being, those who are not saved being blinded. Verse number nine, uh, 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. Verse 19 mentions about immorality of different kinds that are common to the ungodly. Verse 21, if so be that ye have heard him and have taught by, and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, let's talk about our old sinful nature, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, 
and be renewed in the mind, the spirit of your mind. And this is only something God can do once you get saved to start changing you from the inside out and, and your, the spirit of your heart and mind. Verse 24, and that ye put on the new man, which is after God and created in righteousness and true holiness. And verse 25 through 32 now lists characteristics that exemplify Christians not doing certain things, putting into practice certain things. This is the beauty of the church, not confined to these walls. Outside of here is the mission field. Outside of here is where we get to let people know, hey, we're the real deal. We're not fakers. Yes, we're human. We make our mistakes, but man, we love our God and we love our church. We want God's work to go forward. The reason why the church can be unstoppable is because Christ is our head. The church is not confined by these walls. We're to practice what the Bible says outside these walls as well. And you've been doing that and it's been awesome. Number three, the church on mission has God's favor. This is kind of neat. Look at Acts chapter two, verse number 46, 47. The church on mission has God's favor. I'm not sure that I've ever pointed it out this way before, but just reading it once again and kind of looking at it as I was going through, it just kind of popped off the page to me as I was going through with this particular study. The church on mission has God's favor. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 46. Here we have multitudes of people getting saved. They're so excited about their newfound faith. That's something about a new Christian. They're just excited. They don't know what they're excited about other than being delivered from the sin debt. They don't know all the doctrine. They don't even know all their, their Christianisms and everything, but they're just, I'm just happy that I got new life in Christ and they just want to be around other Christians. They want to be encouraged. And that's what's going on here. They were so excited. They were selling their possessions and helping the poor. They were trying to help out those who had needs. And that's the beauty of the church. So the church on mission has God's favor. Notice in verse 46, and they continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, meaning they were unified together as a church body, praising God, notice next, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. One of the blessings of a church that's unified, a church that is on mission doing God's work, is God's hand of favor is upon them. Listen, you want God to bless in your life? Do his work. You call yourself a Christian. If you get involved with God's work, you'll watch his hand of blessing be upon you. Hey, that could be your business being blessed because God says, okay, I can trust you to do something with that. You can use that money. Or it could be that he sees that you're a witness. He sees that your, your family is able to be used. He sees that you're uh, trustworthy. When you start getting on mission with God, his hand of favor can be upon you and he can start allowing you to have more blessings. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to go through trials. Don't miss this. Sometimes those who are blessed go through trials as well. But how you go through it is so important because it demonstrates something about your faith in God. So the church on mission has God's favor. How, they, uh, how? Why was their favor? They were empowered by God. They were preaching the truth and they were living their lives for others. That's a simple way to understand how do you want to be blessed by God or how do you want God's hand of favor on you? You're empowered by God. You're the preaching the truth of the word of God and they were living their life to honor others. Number four, and we're almost done. The church learns to adapt to circumstances. The church learns to adapt to circumstances. Listen, life is a total adaptation for all of us. You go through different stages of life, you have to adapt to this, adapt to that, at work, at home, at school, doesn't matter. When the pandemic breaks out, we all had to adapt to a new type of schedule. We all had to adapt to new ways of cleanliness. We all had to adapt to different things. Some people buck against it, some people foment against it, some people get all irate and mad, some people just kind of go along with it. But listen, the church learns to adapt to circumstances. Persecution, sickness, government restrictions, social unrest, all part of culture since the early days. Particularly in Jesus' time, we have now a king, a puppet king, who's willing to persecute Christians. Think about that. If that happened today, we couldn't imagine that happening in America. But if it did, what would happen to Christianity? Well, one, it would root out the real ones from the fake ones right away. You would have the real ones and the fake ones rooted out immediately because Christians who are not real, they only go along with the crowd, there would be an issue with them wanting to get together. I'm not risking my life for that. And we're not talking about this pandemic. We're talking about 
Talk about a king who wants to kill you. And so we understand that a church learns to adapt to circumstances. In, in uh, Acts chapter number 8, we learn of Stephen being killed, one of the first martyrs of the early church. At, and Apostle Paul uh, at that time, Saul, was there consenting to his death. Now in Acts chapter 12, we see James, a fellow uh, fisherman with the apostles, brother of John. He's the one now put to death by King Herod because it pleased the Jews. What a horrible thing to happen. It shows you how, how they treated life back then. But we must understand that persecution, sickness, government restrictions, social unrest, all uh, have been going on for many, many years. And so this pressure for the church to adapt, we've adapted. And the beauty of the church is not only has it adapted, it's continued the message. It's continued to have Christians living it outside of the church walls. We don't just come to church on Sunday and act like a Christian. Some do. That's sad. But the majority of our Christians really do live it out in the real world. That's the beauty. They've adapted to what's going on in our society, and they're still living the life honoring God. So we go, we go back and we understand here that the reason why the God's church is unstoppable, Jesus Christ is our head. The church is not confined to these walls. The church on mission has God's favor upon it. That's individuals as well as the body. And the church learns to adapt to different circumstances of life. Persecution, sickness, discouragement, all these things come into all our lives. But living for God and honoring God still says so much about your genuine faith. The church is not immune to trouble, persecution, sickness, and death. But how the church responds speaks volumes about your faith. The church is unstoppable when it remembers that Jesus Christ is its head and continues in the mission in the face of adversity. Earlier on, I coined the phrase, the church scattered does matter. And it still matters. Even though we have a partial reassembling of our church, regathering our church, there are still many, for, for good reasons, that can't meet with us. But yet, they're still carrying on the message of Jesus Christ out there to our community. And I would just challenge you, when you think about a church being unstoppable, number one, Jesus Christ is our head, and we're to live out the things that bring pleasure to our God, and our church will continue to be unstoppable. I am so thankful that you're able to meet back with us here.